Hello and welcome to another lecture for Introduction to Psychology. In this lecture we will be talking about human sexuality. Preview of what we're going to talk about in this set of slides. We'll talk about sex and gender. We'll look at androgyny. We'll look at some theories of gender. We'll look at gender throughout the lifespan, so a little bit of developmental there. And we'll finish up with sexual orientation. On the next slide is a video that's kind of going to give a primer to what's going to be in this set of slides. People have been having sex and writing songs about it and carving statues of it and changing fashion for it since the dawn of humanity. But it wasn't until fairly recently, the 1940s, that serious Western scientific study of sex began. And by most accounts, you can thank one guy for that. Alfred Kinsey. Kinsey was born in 1894 in New Jersey to poor, strict Methodist parents. He studied entomology in college, graduating with degrees in biology and psychology before heading to Harvard. His doctoral thesis was on the genealogy of gall wasps, a subject he tackled with intensity, meticulously collecting over five million samples, measuring hundreds of thousands of specimens. And wasps are interesting and everything, but Kinsey's interests drifted toward human sexuality. And his research at Indiana University paved the way for decades of study into sex. He surveyed thousands of men and women about their sexual habits and histories and found all sorts of interesting things related to sexual preferences, masturbation, orgasms, and premarital sex. He established the Kinsey Scale, indicating degrees of sexual orientation, and went on to write the seminal text on sexual behavior in the human male and female, respectively. Like many of the first researchers of human behavior, Kinsey and his colleagues were, and in some ways still are, pretty controversial. But he definitely succeeded in two very important tasks. One, he was an early adopter of a scientific approach to studying sex, and two, he showed that the popular perception of what people do and don't do sexually versus what people actually do and feel was often very different. Since then, we've seen innumerable sex-related studies examining the physiological, psychological, and social elements of sex. And, you know, there's a whole lot of lingering misinformation and judgy morality swirling around the subject of sex. It can be a tricky topic for sure, but we are here to clear some things up. It's the entire purpose of life, so there's no reason to blush. <laughs> So, sex. That one little word has complicated so many lives. The desire for or lack of sex has spawned poetry and made babies and transmitted diseases and cost money and driven people batty and kept late night cable and business. Even the word itself can mean many different things. First, we got the verb kind of sex, the physical process of engaging in sexual acts and intercourse, which Probably I don't need to describe to you. Then we've got the biological definition having to do with anatomical parts that go with the designations of male or female or intersex, those who are born with reproductive parts that don't fall into predominant definitions of male or female. And these are quite separate from gender or an individual's sense of identifying as male or female or another gender identity, regardless of how that corresponds with their actual reproductive plumbing. For transgender people, for instance, gender identity typically doesn't match biological sex. And remember that gender identity is completely different from sexual orientation, which we'll talk about in a minute. So beyond definitions, we've got the physiological and the psychological aspects of sex. Let's start out with the physiological, and with that, Masters and Johnson. In the late 1950s and 60s, American gynecologist William Masters and his collaborator and future wife, sexologist Virginia Johnson, did something no researcher had ever done before. They invited nearly 700 male and female volunteers, many of whom were sex workers, to come into their lab and get it on, either alone or with their partners. Their aim? to record the body's physiological response to sex. This involved wearing a whole lot of wires and heart monitors and such, and it was probably about as sexy as it sounds. All the volunteers had to be willing and able to show arousal and capable of orgasm, and over the years, Masters and Johnson recorded more than 10,000 sexual cycles. The main thing they documented was that a complete sexual response cycle involved four distinct stages. Excitement, plateau, orgasm and resolution, which Masters and Johnson maintained happen in a linear way, one after the other. In the excitement phase, things are getting going, blood is rushing to all of the necessary places, genital areas are becoming engorged and secreting lubricant. Next comes the plateau phase, pulse, blood pressure, and breathing rates keep increasing, and genitals are becoming fully engorged, the penis is often secreting pre-ejaculate as vaginal secretions increase until the big event, orgasm, during which muscles all over the body contract 
act, and breathing and pulse rates hit their peak. Of course, a biological male orgasm typically releases sperm that may lead to fertilization, depending on the situation, but female arousal and orgasm also help facilitate conception, again, depending on the situation, as those muscle contractions and lubrication help draw up and retain sperm in the uterus. Finally, the body comes back down to its normal state of affairs during the resolution phase. It's during this phase that biosex males enter a refractory period during which they're unable to orgasm again for a few minutes to a day or more, whereas a biological female's refractory period is very short in comparison. While the four-stage model of sexual response is still taught today, some have criticized both its rigid linear setup, arguing that things don't always work so tidily in the bedroom, and its insistence on including orgasm, which doesn't happen for everyone all the time. Others also question the model's clinical focus on only physiological factors, arguing that cultural attitudes, psychological and relationship factors, and other external details should also be considered when looking at sexual response. I'll get back to that in a minute, but before we move on to the psychology of sex, we gotta talk about hormones. You remember hormones, those chemical messengers brewed up by the endocrine system that travel through the bloodstream and regulate all sorts of physiological and behavioral activities from growth to digestion to sleep to sex. Our sex hormones serve two major purposes. One, they direct the physical development of biological sex characteristics, and two, they help activate sexual behavior. Estrogens, like estradiol, contribute to female sex characteristics and are secreted in greater amounts by females than males. And while all humans make testosterone, it's the predominant sex hormone for males, stimulating the growth and development of male sex characteristics. Now, most female mammals become sexually receptive when their estrogens peak during ovulation, but it doesn't really work that way for humans. Our hormones are more loosely related to sexual behavior, although studies have found that, in general, female sexual desire spikes slightly around ovulation, when women are most fertile, and males can also be affected by this spike, responding with higher levels of testosterone when ovulating women are around. But these short-term changes hardly compare to the larger, more major hormonal shifts that occur throughout a lifetime. Puberty, for one, tends to get everyone a lot more hot and bothered and interested in dating and gazing at posters of their favorite celebrity crushes, and later in life, as sex hormone production naturally decreases, our amorous urges and endeavors tend to decrease as well. Age affects our libido. But in the end, you might think of sex hormones as fuel for your sexual engine. And while an engine can't run on a totally empty tank, it also won't run any better or worse on a full tank versus a half tank. We need our sex hormones, but we also need the right psychological stimuli to turn us on and keep us going sexually. So, finally, Let's look at some of these psychological aspects of sex. First, there are the very important social and cultural influences. Things like your families, your societies, your religions, and your personal values. Does your community view sex merely as the means for reproduction, or can it be fun too? What are the views on premarital sex and homosexuality, showing some skin or kissing in public? And there are the influences of external stimuli. In Western society, we're constantly bombarded with sexually charged content from movies and TV to advertisements R&B slow jams and Victoria's Secret catalogs, and constantly looking at images of things that you find extremely attractive can lead to folks viewing more average people, even their own partners, as being less attractive. But our sexual desire is also fueled by internal stimuli, our imaginations and memories and fantasies. According to plenty of studies, at least 95% of people fantasize about sex at some point. The thing you gotta keep in mind is that none of these factors work independently of each other. How we respond to both external and internal stimuli can be really heavily influenced by social and cultural factors, and that is where a lot of the thinking and studying of sex has gotten really complicated. Human judgment and morality is often entangled with sex and desire, and sadly, a lot of people have been made to feel miserable for liking certain things or being attracted to certain people. There's also just been a lot of misinformation out there. I mean, for ages, a lot of folks believed that masturbation could make you go blind, become mentally ill, or kill the neighborhood kittens, it doesn't do that. And as I know you're thinking right now, one area of sexuality that's been needlessly associated with conflict, fear, and shame in many cultures is sexual orientation. For our purposes, sexual orientation can be defined as a relatively enduring physical or romantic attraction to another person. Heterosexual, homosexual, and bisexual are all types of sexual orientation, and although the field once stigmatized non-heterosexual orientations, we now know that homosexuality and bisexuality are in no way related to mental health. Psychologists are also 
also beginning to look more in depth at other sexual orientations, for instance, asexuality or non-sexuality, where no sexual attraction of any kind is experienced. In any case, whether a culture itself is friendly to or tyrannical against any of these orientations, all types prevail. Sexual orientation is neither chosen nor changed. So, what might cause these differences? Hopefully you already know this, but it's worth repeating. There's no evidence that sexual orientation is determined by things like a dominating mother or a passive father or sex hormone levels in your adult body or your history of childhood abuse or whether your parents were gay or straight. In other words, decades of research have led most researchers to believe that once you're born, there are no clear environmental factors that influence your sexual orientation. And there's been a lot of research into possible biological components of sexual orientation, like genetics, brain anatomy, prenatal conditions, or other things. It's also important to know that we're far from understanding sexual orientation on a purely biological level. If anything, the evidence we've got simply strengthens the idea that sexual orientation isn't a choice, but rather a naturally varying occurrence among human beings, like height. So, after all this talk about sex, perhaps you're wondering why we do it at all. I mean, it feels good, obviously, but the biggest function of sex goes beyond pure pleasure. In fact, sexual intimacy serves many of life's most basic purposes, sometimes procreation, but also stress reduction, maintaining healthy relationships, social bonding, and the expression of love and overall fulfillment. People say the brain is the most significant sex organ for a reason, and intimacy is often its own reward. Today, you learned about Alfred Kinsey's groundbreaking sex surveys, the differences between how we define biological sex and gender identity, and about Masters and Johnson's four-part sexual response cycle. We also looked at the role of sex hormones in our development and drive, how psychological and social factors play into sex, how we think about sexual orientation and why we have sex in the first place. Thanks for watching, especially to our Subbable subscribers who make Crash Course possible. To find out how you can become a supporter, just go to subbable.com slash Crash Course. This episode was written by Kathleen Yale, edited by Blake DiBastino, and our consultant is Dr. Ranjit Bhagwat. Our director and editor is Nicholas Jenkins, our sound designer is Michael Ronda, and the graphics team is Thought Cafe. All right, there's one or two things I kind of disagree with from that previous slide, but we'll come back to that when we're talking about sexual orientation and things like that. But I hope that gave you a good overview of the things we're going to cover, as well as some other things in human sexuality that may be of interest to you. Before we go any farther, I want to differentiate sex and gender. So sex is your biological sex. When we refer to sex, we're referring to biological sex. So your biological sex is your physical characteristics that define male and female, or your genetics that define male and female. So at XX for female, XY for males, we're at this point in time ignoring the genetic abnormalities that can occur like XXY or fragile X. We're just looking at the, the basic two biological sexes, and they are, comp they are differentiated in their biological makeup. However, on the other hand, gender. Gender is the features in which a society associates with maleness and femaleness. So it, I said male, men and women are appropriate for men and women, but it's along the lines of maleness and femaleness. And all societies that are, have been studied um, expect the two different sexes to take on different gender roles. So those that are biologically male, it's expected to take on maleness gender roles. Those that are biologically female are expected to take on femaleness gender roles. But again, gender is differentiated from sex in that sex is your biological makeup, whereas gender is not biological, but is related to that biological but is mainly along the lines of what is considered maleness and femaleness in society. Each society's norms generate, generate gender stereotypes. So these gender stereotypes we have about what is appropriate for men, what is appropriate for women, are generated by a society or a culture's norms about what is appropriate for, for men and women. And then these norms and stereotypes affect how we perceive ourselves and other people. 
if you have a norm that that men are supposed to be masculine that men are supposed to be aggressive then we will see ourselves in others when we're talking about at least men as in that context if women are supposed to be weak I'm not saying they are I'm saying if the gender stereotype is that they're weak then the we will perceive ourselves and others in that context relating to that I the the overarching thing that that shapes our gender roles and stereotypes is this these differentiated views of roles that men and women have specifically in in many societies the women's role of nurturer and childbearer shapes the gender role norms so they're they're expected to have a communality a community or this emphasis on connectedness to others um, being more emotional being more sensitive to others being more empathetic all of these types of things that come along with this role of nurturer in, in communality whereas in many societies the central aspect of males is agency or individual action and achievement so individuality as well as provider and and not as much the nurturer side which is the women's role but the provider side and the protector side there are some differences and similarities that we found between men and women actually there are many there are a long long list I'm just going to talk about a few here not really looking at, at getting too specific in a lot of areas I just want to point out that there are gender differences that have been found between men and women uh, females display greater verbal ability and greater memory uh, this is found cross-culturally and I should say in the greater memory it's in most domains and the greater verbal abilities in most domains but not all domains and before I go any farther I do need to throw this disclaimer out there whenever we're talking about sex differences or gender differences or anything like this we're not saying that all of one gender or sex is greater than all of another we're saying that on average the average is greater for one sex or gender than the other and yes I'm using sex and gender here because we've got sex differences and gender differences and quite often these sex and gender differences have a strong overlap so even if there is a difference between sex and gender we, we can look at these in a very similar way because there is a lot of overlap uh, females tend to be more tactful cooperative compliant and empathetic and this goes back to that nurturer role I was talking about females are more prone to anxiety disorders depression and phobias so when we talk in the context of uh, psychological disorders there are certain disorders that females are more prone to males are better at many tests of spatial ability this is kind of an interesting one so most tests of spatial ability males do better on there's actually one specific test of spatial ability that women do better than men on that they found and that is when we're talking about localized food gathering so it's it's when the test that they tested the test that they did to find this is they took people to a large flea market where there were stalls for various different things around it and they had people men and women wander around it and then they took them to one point in the flea market and said okay now point to where this stall is point to where that stall is and in that case women did better than men it was more localized and there was food involved and when you think about this in the evolutionary context this actually makes sense because whereas men at least evolutionary in our evolutionary history would have been traveling long distances for hunting more often women more often would have been the gatherers they would have been doing more localized food gathering so to have these brain structures that for men are better at, at finding direction over long distances but for women are better at finding direction over short distances when food is involved it makes sense men tend to engage more in more physical and verbal aggression and are more physically active and this goes back to that role of agency that we were talking about 
Males are more likely to develop antisocial disorder and abuse drugs and alcohol. So when it comes to the domains of abnormal psychology and psychological disorders, men are more likely for antisocial disorder as well as uh, using substance, using and abusing substances. However, when it comes to things like math tests, standardized math tests, men and women perform similarly. We, we kind of get this wrong in these stereotypes that we have that men are better at math than women are. And I talked about this earlier in the semester, but it's really one of those interesting things that even people who know there's this bias and really what it comes down to is, is ma male students, so boys, get more focus from teachers than girls do because of this subconscious belief that, that boys are better at math. Even when the, the math teacher is aware of this bias, so there's a female math teacher who, who basically published studies on this about how this bias is present. Even when she was studied, she showed this subconscious bias. So it's a real hard thing to get past. Let's talk about androgyny for a minute. So androgyny is divine, defined as showing characteristics of both genders. And so uh, individuals who will show, especially individuals who maybe are female, will, who will show masculine characteristics, or individuals who are male who will show feminine characteristics. One thing we found is, is that in the US, each successive generation has become more androgynous. So each generation, you, your parents would have been less androgynous than you are, your grandparents less androgynous than they are, your children should be more androgynous than you are, meaning we are moving towards a society where our gender roles and norms are becoming more and more overlapped. And then I've got pictures here and it's my joke that because we're not in the classroom, I can't hear you laugh at my really corny dad joke, but uh, on the right we've got Arya here, Arya is from Game of Thrones, and Arya is a girl who was pretending to be a boy. And on the left, we've got Bieber here, and Bieber is a boy pretending to be a musician. See, my jokes are corny. Now, that being said, uh, it's, it's still showing, beyond the joke, it's showing that, yes, when we look at individuals like Justin Bieber when he was growing up he he showed a lot of feminine characteristics as well and that is something that again people are becoming more androgynous however there is a, a negative side to that and that is that as Bieber has become an adult he has he got made fun of for being for having these feminine characteristics. So he's actually pushed back at it and become hyper-masculine. If you look up pictures of him today, he's covered in tattoos and he's just gone very hyper-masculine in order to push back against this view that, that he is androgynous. All right, let's now shift into some theories of gender role development. First, we'll start with the biosocial theory. And the biosocial theory says that once a biological male or female is born, the biological side, social labeling and differential treatment, so the social side, the social labeling and differential treatment of both boys and girls interact with their genetics to steer their development. Then at puberty, biological factors again become strongly inf influential as hormones are released into the system, stimulating growth of the reproductive system, the secondary characteristics, and that these events, and along with the person's earlier self-concept as male or female, provide the basis for adult gender identity and role behavior. So now here we're talking about gender identity for the first time, we'll come back to it a little bit, but we talked about identity in the previous set of slides. Well, now we're gonna look at gender identity as well, and that is, one's own sense of maleness or femaleness. So biosocial theory looks at this interaction between the biological factors as well as social factors and shows that puberty is a very important event because at puberty it becomes strongly biological again due to the large quantities of hormones that are released into the system. <clears throat> 
So according to social learning theorists, on the other hand, children learn gender identities, preferences, and behaviors through two different processes. First is differential reinforcement. That is, children are rewarded for sex appropriate behaviors and punished for behaviors that are not sex appropriate. So in this, this differential reinforcement, children learn what's appropriate for their, their specific sex by the reinforcement and punishments that they get growing up, as well as through observational learning. So watching the, those that are their same sex models and modeling their behavior. Now there is some evidence that social learning theory is at play, especially this observational learning. However, social learning theorists completely ignore the biological side. So if social learning theorists were true, those who are just observing those who are maybe very androgynous should become very androgynous themselves, but that's not necessarily the case. Cognitive theory, on the other hand, looks at how children can't learn the social side of it until they acquire certain understandings. Basically, it's looking at how mental and psychological development and how the brain developing has to get to a certain point before they can be influenced by social experiences. And so in this case, they say that, so, that children engage in self-socialization rather than being passive, they're active in it as well. So now we take a mix kind of social and looking at social is all about observational punishment and, and reinforcement and in cognitive saying that you've got to have these biological systems in place and children are not just influenced by, not just passive in it, but they're active in it. And really you've got to mix those together with that biosocial so we're getting a full picture when we incorporate everything together, that there is biological components, there is cognitive components, but there is definitely social components as well. And let's look at some of these social components. And these social components come along with the cognitive frameworks. So we talked about schemas. We talked about schemas before earlier in the semester. Now let's look at gender schema theories. And that is how individual schemas that the children and adults basically associate with each gender and how that's influenced. First of all, they are formed based mainly on in early life, uh, early life social interactions as well as family. So what is learned from family members, from parents, from caregivers, and these early life social interactions. Then they are reinforced and, and kind of uh, continually formed based on media that we get after that. There's also a big confirmation bias that comes in when we're talking about gender role schema, being that uh, we notice what confirms our gender schema theory and we tend to ignore what doesn't confirm it. And really gender schema theory strongly applies to the self and how the the we we view ourselves both in terms of our gender as well as what is appropriate for our gender it's a really good video on the next slide we'll get to that hi everyone and animated stephanie here ready to talk to you all about gender schema theory as you can see from this week's topic this theory falls under the category of individual and group differences. Within this very broad subject, gender schema theory focuses on how gender differences come to be and how a person becomes gendered in society. So before getting into more details about this theory, let's first take a look at what the word schema means in the field of psychology. So from Piaget, we learned that a schema is a group of related ideas or actions. So take a second and think of an egg. I know it's a really weird example, but just go with it. Look at all the network of associations or set of interrelated ideas that come up in relation to an egg. Now imagine a similar organization system or framework in your brain. When you think of a certain concept, your brain activates a schema and unconsciously brings up all of this other information that is linked and associated to this concept. 
like the different colors, uses, and origins of eggs. One person has a whole lot of schemas for a variety of concepts, as you can see in this really complicated map. These schemas or knowledge structures act like channels or filters that process new information and they guide you in paying attention to things that fit into your schema and then you tend to ignore or explain away things that don't fit in. So now let's get to what a gender schema is. Think of the concept of man, and there's Channing Tatum, just so you can bring that up to mind. What are some of the associations that come into your head? A few that pop into mind are now popping up onto the screen, as you can see. And in adding these words, what I'm doing is actually creating a gender schema. So this is what pops into my head. These are all of the cognitive structures that are activated by the brain of thought of male or female. So a set of all the stereotypical associations that come up when you envision a man or a woman. Someone with a strong gender schema will impulsively categorize new information in relation to gender, as opposed to any other notion, uh, such as ethnicity or age. In effect, they will sort people, characteristics, and behaviors into masculine and feminine categories. So, for example, a gender schematic person will see a young girl, as you can see in the picture, who constantly hugs and kisses her parents, and they will associate her affectionate behavior to her female gender and not maybe just her young age. So yeah, she's just acting like a girl, hugging and kissing people. Since um, this gender schema theory guides their perception, a gender schematic will be will more, like, more likely notice things that are consistent with their gender norms. They will see strong, brave men and ignore those that are more soft and delicate in manner. Moreover, these gender schemas become internalized and are used to process information about the self. From the gender schema, a person learns which attributes are to be linked with their own sex and hence with themselves. However, it's important to remember that people vary in the degree to which they are gender schematic. So how are these gender schemas formed? Let's take a look at that for a while. From a young age, children are taught the many sex-related associations that form the basis of a gender schema. These lessons can come from a number of uh, environmental cues, such as what they are told by their parents, uh, how they see other people behaving in real life, advertisements they see on TV or billboards, movies, and the media. A gender schema theory relies on the assumption that children learn what it means to be male and female by observing the world around them. After they make these observations, they modify their behaviors to fit into what is, what is normal and expected by the culture that surrounds them. So now let's take a look at an example of gender schema theory at work. A little boy watches his dad do all the repairs around the house. He observes his dad using tools to fix the sink, build an extra room, and paint the walls. Over time, the connection between his dad and construction becomes part of his schema. Then he begins to associate the schema with his own self-concept and gender. Since he is a boy too, he will be interested in tools, building, and construction. Eventually, he will even come to consider these behaviors masculine. So now that we're all gender schema theorists, we have to ask ourselves, what can we do in the classroom with this information? We can use this theory to understand student behavior in the classroom. So Jason's, Jason's disruptive behavior during individual reading time may be due to a gender schema that associates this quiet, passive activity with how girls should behave. Or Jessica's lack of effort in math class may stem from a gender schema that places math skills under the male category. So it's up to us teachers to modify our lessons in such a way that we promote gender equality and make sure we break down gender stereotypes. We should take the time to focus away from splitting things along gendered lines. So, for example, try not to call your class back in order by saying, hey, boys and girls, listen up. This just emphasizes the separation between the girls in the room and the boys in the room. Don't use math problems that ask students to calculate how many dishes a woman washed or how fast a man was racing a car down along the track. So avoid gender stereotypes. Uh, and you can show Jessica's class some of the famous women that have contributed to the world of mathematics. And for Jason, you can invite a male author to your class to read from one of the books he has written. And that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed the video. And um, 
yeah, that's it. That's Gender Schema in a nutshell. So thank you for listening. I hope that video cleared up any questions you might have had and how uh, basically we form our gender schema theory. Now let's transition a little bit into some of the social aspect, mainly things like the differential treatment that infants are given. We're going to go through the lifespan now, but let's start with infants. First of all, infants, uh, there's a definite differential treatment that occurs in infants. There's differences between males and females, but the actual differences between the actual differences that exist between males and females at birth are small and inconsistent. In adulthood, in, in adolescence, the, the, these differences become larger, but in infancy, at birth, the differences that are present are, are very small and very inconsistent. However, soon after birth, infants begin to receive a very big differential treatment. What I mean by that is in the language of description. So boys are described as masculine. They're described in terms of their strength. Look at how strong he is. Look at how big he is. Things like that. Girls, female infants are described as soft, cuddly, adorable. Look at how cute she is. Look at how soft and cuddly, that type of thing. So the, the language that's used around infants is already starting to differentiate into this schema, this gender theory. Even things like clothing, so the way infants and then into children are dressed, their hairstyles that they're given, their toys that they're allowed to have or that are bought for them before they can choose them themselves, their room furnishings that are made for them. We, Like I said, we are becoming more androgynous, so some of these things are becoming less pronounced, but it is still something that exists in the vast majority of cases where we've got this differentiation. Then into childhood, we get early learning. So infants learn to categorize male and females. They then start to associate themselves with which category they belong. It's what they're labeled as, as well as they start to just associate it based on similarities and differences. By 18 months, most toddlers seem to have an understanding that they are like males or like females. By two and a half to three years old, most children can give proof that they've acquired a basic sense of gender identity and that they identify in one of the categories, male or female. Uh, boys and girls start to demonstrate preferences for gender appropriate activities and toys. Uh, and again, we're not looking at, at biological sex here. We're looking at gender that, that these boys and girls identify themselves as and that's one of the things that should be pointed out when we're talking about gender identity which we'll talk about in a little bit is this that children as young as two years old start to have a sense of being of a specific gender and if that gender is different than their biological sex they've got the they still I have these gender preferences for things of the, the gender that they feel. And then by 30 to 36 months, children actually begin to favor same-sex playmates rather than opposite-sex playmates. Uh, throughout the childhood years, there's still this, uh, the they'll, they'll, children will play with those of the opposite gender, but up until adolescence, children favor same-sex playmates. So let's look at some of those childhood gender roles. Uh, during childhood, there's this strong sense of gender identity being formed. There's gender constancy. What I mean here is, is those individuals who view themselves as male, female, maleness, femaleness, masculinity, femininity, that type of thing, it tends to actually stay consistent from an early age. It doesn't tend to change that much. So when we're talking about transgendered individuals, 
that's something a little bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about right now, but when we're talking about transgendered individuals, they tend to have this gender constancy from a very young age. During this time, these gender role stereotypes are being formed, so the standards for dress and behavior are what's being formed during this time. What is appropriate for maleness? What is appropriate for female maleness? These standards are there for not only how they dress, how they look, but how they behave. So this is where you get to where males and maleness and masculinity is viewed more as an agency, as independency. That's why boys are, are allowed to do more, be more active, that type of thing. Whereas girls are supposed to be, not girls, but femaleness. Females are supposed to be more nurturing. So the, that independence and activity is, is not as encouraged. So this is where you kind of get that standards for behavior being formed. children have a strong sense of gender identity and gender role expectations. Most two-year-olds know with certainty whether they are male or female, and by the age of four or five begin not only to develop gender constancy, but often show rigid standards for what they believe is appropriate male and female dress and behavior. Can boys put on dresses? Do girls have short hair or long hair? Long hair. Are you a boy or a girl? A boy. <laughs> are you ever going to be a girl? No. What are boys like? Oh, I don't know. Are they different than girls? How are they different than girls? Because they don't put stuff like girls on. <laughs> boys don't put on girls' clothes? No. <laughs> Can girls put on boys' clothes? No. Alexis, are you a boy or a girl? A girl. Are you ever going to be a boy? Mm -mm. Are you a boy or a girl? Boy. Are you ever going to be a girl? No. Boys are better than girls. Why? Because boys are stronger than the girls sometimes. What would happen if you put on a dress? All the girls and all the boys would laugh at me. I wouldn't look like a boy, that wouldn't look like a girl. Would it be okay? No way. Young children appear to begin to acquire gender role stereotypes at about the same time that they develop gender identity. And by the age of three or four, most children, when asked questions about the activities appropriate for a male doll and a female doll, readily give stereotypic responses. Which doll likes to clean the house? This one. Who takes care of the babies? What? <laughs> this one. Who goes to work? <laughs> this one. Those videos are always interesting and in that you get to see these consistent views from the same kids over and over again and how and there you got to see how the even at a young age these gender role stereotypes are being formed and these are some of these things that even though we're becoming more androgynous we're becoming less uh, focused on uh, what is appropriate for males being specific to males and what is appropriate for females being specific to females. We're getting to a point where it's becoming more, like I said, androgynous, but you see in that video, even then, it's really hard to get away from that even at a young age, these kids are seeing that it's the, the women's responsibility for taking care of kids and the men's responsibility for having jobs. So let's transition now into adolescence. So adolescence, it's about adhering to gender roles. So in adolescence, we have what's called a gender intensification. And this goes back to that biosocial theory, where, as I said, 
the biological is important at birth, but then social influences take effect, but then in adolescence and puberty, biology comes back in. So what's actually happening here is, is there's this gender intensification happening at puberty when children, adolescents, are going through these hormonal changes. So boys begin to see themselves as more masculine, more maleness. Girls begin to emphasize their femininity and femaleness. And again, not all those who are individuals who are transgendered from a young age still are experiencing that now. But in general, the boys are, are now focusing more on that masculinity and maleness, and the girls are focusing more on that femininity and femaleness. So a lot of that the, the androgynousness you get in late childhood before adolescence goes away. There is good news, and I'm not going to talk about it more in the later slides until full adulthood, but the, the after puberty in the early 20s, people tend to become more androgynous again. But we'll look at that in late adulthood too. So the, the stereotypical thinking about gender roles and intolerance of gender role violations increases in adolescence. So those individuals who maybe are inconsistent with their gender, who are more androgynous, the, the males who are um, acting feminine, the females who are acting masculine, that tends to have an intolerance. Good news is we, we are advancing as society and we're becoming more open and tolerant of transgendered individuals and individuals who are more androgynous. So this gender intolerance, this gender roles intolerance is lessening over time. So those of you who are younger, you, you might already be in a stage where this intolerance it might still have been present, but mainly not there and then by your kid by the time your kids are in high school and at, and uh, reaching puberty it should even be greater of a intolerance of intolerance so to say now into adulthood we kind of get changes in gender roles so the the when marriage happens, the roles actually become more distinct, especially in parenthood. When children are born, it becomes more about women being the nurturer, men being the, the provider. But at the same time, like I said, we're in a society where it's becoming more accepting to be out of that. But at midlife, when the children are leaving the home, men and women become freed of the demands of what's called the parental imperative. That parental imperative is that women need to be the caregiver, men need to be the provider. So in midlife, when the children are leaving the home, this parental imperative is lessened or gone. So at this point, we get men become less active, more passive. Uh, women become more focused on, uh, women become more active, domineering, assertive, and stronger forces of community. So this, this really there's a androgyny shift going on in later adulthood after the children leave the home in that men are becoming more feminine and less masculine and women are becoming more masculine and less feminine, at least when we talk about our stereotypical definitions of masculinity and femininity. Okay, last thing we're going to talk about here is sexual identity. So we're looking at the formation of sexual orientation. So again, we talked in the, the previous set of slides about identity. Now we're going to, um, we talked a little bit about gender identity. Now let's talk about sexual identity. So this formation of sexual orientation. Uh, it's usually formed in adolescence, though it can start earlier. In many individuals, they, they have an indication of this preference for individuals of the same gender at an even earlier age than puberty. It, it's not a necessarily sexual attraction by that point, but maybe more of a preference. Um, there is a strong biological basis for sexual orientation. Um, we know that, uh, and I'll talk about this in future slides, but we know that twins, if one twin is 
homosexual, there's a greater than 50% chance that the other twin as well. So the, and that's identical twins. And that is not present in fraternal twins. So there's a strong biological basis. There is also a social basis. And this is something you won't that I disagree with in that first video that was there. So in that first video, they basically talked about sexual orientation is, is entirely biological. It is not politically correct to say that there is a social basis for sexual orientation. However, that is just completely inaccurate when we look at the science. There is both a biological and social basis, just biological and environmental basis, just like anything else we've talked about this semester. It's not entirely biological or entirely environmental. It's a mix of the two. There is evidence that um, certain social influences, certain environmental influences can affect sexual orientation. Let's look at that a little bit more. Everyone goes through a period of figuring out who they're attracted to and who is attracted to them. Sexual identity involves figuring out who we are sexually, what we like and don't like, and who we're attracted to. Recent surveys of American teens have reported that around 88% of teenagers describe themselves as predominantly heterosexual. About 1-2% to of teens describe themselves as predominantly homosexual or bisexual. And about 10% of teens describe themselves as being confused about their sexual orientation. Now the formation of your identity also revolves around experimenting and trying other adult type behaviors, such as drinking alcohol or doing drugs. As the psychologist Eric Erickson put it, being a teen involves forming our identity in at least three main areas. sexual ideological, and occupational. We form our identity through our relationships, that's the sexual part, our political and religious beliefs, that's the ideological part, and through career choices, that's the occupational part. To put it simply, being a teenager means trying to figure out who we like, what we believe, and what career is best suited for us. Okay, that video did a really good job of explaining things, but let's look at it a little bit more. Um, so, and as I said, before the video, we're going to look at those uh, genetic and environmental factors. We'll look at that on the next slide after this. But let's look at the development. So for adolescents who are attracted to members of their own sex, the process of accepting a homosexual or a bisexual orientation and establishing a positive identity in the face of many of our societal negative attitudes about it can be difficult. We have shifted. So a lot of the stuff in your book talks about times before same-sex marriage was legal but we're in a time where same-sex marriage is legal where children can or adolescents can be more open about their sexual identity however most individuals even now but definitely historically don't actively embrace their sexual identity until they're in their mid-20s so there might be this initial awareness before puberty uh, but many, even though it's, it's becoming a younger uh, age where this, people are becoming accepting and open about their gender identity because of, again, these, these societal shifts into being more accepting and open. So this most don't until their mid-20s is kind of shifting until teens, late teens, but still many do not become able to tell others until they're in their mid-20s. Let's look at those genetic and environmental factors. First, we'll start with the genetic factors. As I already said, identical twins are more alike in sexual orientation than fraternal twins, meaning that it's in excess of 50% if one identical twin is, is homosexual, the other is, whereas it's around 20% for fraternal twins, which is what you'd expect if you've got a genetic component. So there is a strong genetic component, but it's not entirely genetic. If it was entirely genetic, then identical twins would have almost universal, universally the same sexual orientation. So there are environmental factors. There are things like uh, testosterone in the womb. Uh, there are things like uh, pressures um, to adopt that the so gay and lesbian men who express cross-sex interests when they were young uh, they face this even in the face of unusual pressures but there is these things like 
uh, various different environmental factors that can occur. One of them that people don't like to talk about, but that is abuse. One thing that is known is that individuals who are molested as children are more likely than individuals who are not to adopt a uh, bisexual or homosexual orientation. It's one of those things that, that, again, it's not politically correct to talk about, but the research shows that it's true. Just because there are environmental factors, though, and there's one more thing, there's hormonal influences during prenatal period, so this is an environmental thing that is beyond genetics during the prenatal, but just because there are these environmental factors that are present, just because that's there, doesn't mean that we can bash on those who are homosexual by saying that it's a choice they, and they could choose to be heterosexual. And even then, let's, let's take it a step farther and say, even if it was a choice, how are we, who are we to say that someone who chooses a certain orientation is bad or morally wrong? That's, it's up to the individual if a choice was present. I'm not saying a choice is present because there are such strong genetic factors and these environmental factors tend to be things that occurred early in life. So that life history theory type of thing. So when we look at this, it's definitely not the case of it's just a choice, that type of thing. And another thing of supporting evidence when we look at these types of orientations and it there are strong cultural factors. So as a culture becomes more open to homosexuality and bisexuality, more individuals will actually be expressing homosexual and bisexual behaviors. When we look at historically, you look at early um, Greek and Roman periods where a lot of individuals would have been likely to be bisexual. That's because it was more open and accepted to have that type of sexual orientation. So it's it's not as much along the lines of these these cultural factors are what's causing people to be that, it's more of these cultural factors are allowing people to be themselves more. So in this set of slides, we talked about sex and gender. We talked about androgyny. We looked at some of the theories of gender. We looked at gender throughout the lifespan and we finish it up with sexual orientation. It's This is, in my opinion, a very interesting set of slides and, and I hope that it, it helped elucidate some of the, the factors that go into sex and gender. Thank you. Come on back.